Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us, Ricardo, uh, to participate in this conference. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, as Carl said already. And uh, I'm happy to share a few observations um, and thoughts with you today on the subject of Jung after the publication of the Red Book, a view from the foundation of the works of C.G. Jung. So where has Jung even been before the publication of the Red Book? Carl Gustav Jung had died in 1961 after a lifelong dedication to the development of his psychology. Analytical psychology had established itself as one of the main strands in that psychology. And many of his concepts, uh, such as psychological type, de type definitions, the notion of archetypes, or the collective unconscious, uh, had found their way into everyday speech. With the publication of the 20 volumes edition of his collected works on the way since the 1950s, he was one of the internationally most recognized Swiss thinkers of his time. However, by the 1990s, Jungian studies and psychology experienced somewhat of a downturn. Clinical psychology viewed many of Jung's concepts as outdated or empirically untenable. And for many, a new student of psychology, Jung became nearly a footnote to the history of the discipline. At the same time, he came under pressure in the historical discussion for his social and political views, uh, with the debate focusing on the problem of anti-Semitism, and his professional dealings with Germany in the 1930s on the Nazi rule. Uh, that was particularly the case in the United States and in Germany at that moment. And some of the most ardent criticism at that time was even published by the main young publisher, publishing house in the US. Renewing the general publication agreement with the German publisher uh, at that time, which came up around the year 2000 for the, the collected works, the Gesammel de Werke, was difficult. Uh, and we were only able to keep uh, the works in print by accepting less favorable conditions. So that was the state before the Red Book entered the stage. Behind closed doors, the Society of Ears of, of Jung therefore had begun looking into further possibilities to renew the interest in Jung's work by scrutinizing the archives for yet unpublished material that might refresh the perspective on his psychology. The publication of, of the collected works came to a close uh, with the latest, the last volumes out around 1988, I believe, and, and, and what remained published, uh, unpublished from the vast literary estate at this point in time was namely material of the following categories, text variants, clinical material, correspondences, notes by third parties of Jung's talks, lectures, seminars, and interviews, drafts, um, fragments, concepts, research material, of course, and maybe most significantly, autobiographical and private, as well as the visual artistic material. Already with the publication of his memoirs in 1962, Jung had given insight into the close connection of his inner personal life story and the development of his psychological ideas as laid out in his many published works. Most notably, and many of you will be very familiar with that, uh, there's a full chapter which was dedicated to his confrontation with the unconscious which had resulted in the creation of the Red Book, presenting a deeply personal, yet universal psychological exploration. 
beautifully crafted in medieval calligraphy and illustrated with exquisite, aesthetically elaborated imagery material by Jung's own hand. It was clear to the descendants of Jung that this thick leather-bound folio contained a key to the understanding of Jung's own psychology, but what exactly the Red Book represented to the outer world was an enigma also to the very few who had a chance to have a glimpse at it thus far. In the late 1990s, excerpts from the Red Book surfaced in external archival holdings. And it became clear that already during Jung's lifetime, text copies had circulated outside the family. And that Jung indeed had pondered the possibility of a publication and shared its content with a few select close friends as early as the 1920s. So this uh, allowed a renewed discussion of what to do with the Red Book. 40 years after Jung's death, the time finally seemed ripe to take a fresh look at the situation. Up to that point, concerns among the Jung descendants that a publication of the Red Book could be perceived as the work of a lunatic, and that it was therefore to be kept on the lock and key as a most private document, dominated the internal debate. One problem was that Jung had left his family without any indications or instructions what to do with this visual treasure. Only after closer study and detailed examination of the work, remaining reservations gave way to a basic understanding among the family members that the publication of the Red Book could contribute to a new perspective on Jung's work. And credit here goes specifically to our predecessors uh, and uncles, of course, myself, uh, Ulrich Hörny, and Peter Jung, also Peter's brother, Andreas Jung, uh, who inhabits the house of C.G. Jung until today and was uh, looking after the material for a long time there. They, it was them who, who led and moderated this internal process on behalf of the executive committee of years at the time. And Carl and I, I think we were in our 20s then and both vividly remember very long discuss, discussion sessions, not all, of, all of, of which we in the younger generation were even privy. Uh, but in the following, Sonu Shamdasani, the, and he was actually the historian who had first brought to the attention of the family that transcripts of the Red Book were circulating uh, in other archives. Then he was asked to prepare an essay addressing the question of how could the Red Book be published? With a decision to finally release the work for publication in the year 2000, the next challenge was to define in which way this unique material shall be published, to make it accessible to the Jungian specialists like you, but as well to a wider audience that had never encountered Jung before. After further deliberation, it was determined to follow a guideline of presenting the volume as a first-hand document with as much historical context to its creation as needed for its understanding uh, and, and for understanding the background of its coming uh, into creation, um, but without venturing into any psychological interpretation of its contents in the primary publication, a, a feat that would have simply been impossible uh, given only the four volumes that you have already published and you were not the only ones who have published entire volumes on this uh, major oeuvre so far. The bigger challenge to us, however, was to find a publisher who uh, would take on the task of turning this richly illustrated material 
into a publication of equal quality to its original. All established Jungian publishers in the English and the German language market turned down the project at first. The prospects to ever make enough sales to offset the initial investment in the production seemed too limited to them. Even a pared down version with only a selection of color images and the mere transcript of the text did not meet with the interest of publishing houses either. We keep a large file of records uh, at the offices with all the polite but negative answers of publishers who had received sample material and, and uh, for evaluation and the book proposal, of course. It was finally a personal connection that led to late editor-at-large Jim Mayers at W.W. Norton in New York, which opened the doors for a full publication of the Red Book. He was the first person in the publishing world who recognized the potential of the undertaking. And it was him who committed his press to a full facsimile edition of the book. It is worth recalling that also Norton, publisher Norton had initially rejected the book project when it had first been presented to them. Not at all coming from the Jungian side of publishing, Jim Mayers simply realized the enormous visual appeal of the book as an object, if properly done, sharing first and foremost a fascination that a 20th century man had the stamina to create such an unusual work. Medieval scripture, unique painting style, besides all his other work that he was doing at the time. The Society of Years of C.G. Jung had already commissioned the services of Sonu Shambhasani to edit the Red Book, when in 2004, the Filament Foundation was established by Stephen Martin and a few fellow donors to further the publication of yet unpublished Jung material. Sham Dasani was assuming the function as general editor for the Filament Foundation, and the publication of the Red Book became the first ever project they partnered for with the foundation, with our foundation. Then at the time, it was actually still the Society of Ears of C. G. Jung, namely uh, for the translation of, of the hermetic text into English. So when in 2007, the Society of Ears uh, transferred their copyrights into the current foundation, uh, the old society disbanded. And after that, we set up the current uh, framework for publishing future publication of, of Jung together with the Philemon. Foundation. As has been already mentioned before, uh, when the Red Book was published in 2009 as a, an, an outstanding facsimile edition, it became an almost instant, but all the more unexpected success, success, contributing to what became one of the more remarkable publishing events of that year was an early favor, favorable multi-page review of the work in the New York Times book review, supplementary by Sarah Corbett, published on September 20, 2009, under the headline, The Holy Grail of the Unconscious, featuring statements by several young descendants involved in the making of the publication, together with the editor, Sean Bassani, and a number of prominent Jungians, including Stephen Martin and also Mary Stein. Uh, I think Nancy Folotti was quoted in that one too. Uh, so a number of those who are present today with us. There's always many mothers and fathers to the success. From here on, there was no stopping the spreading of the news of the release of this most unusual work and the story of the man behind it. The Red Book was not just discussed in the usual book review and, and for its own sections of the printed press, but it made headlines in the main evening news, at least on German and Swiss national television, to which to my knowledge was, has never been the case for any of Jung's publication before. Uh, the story of the Red Book was just too fascinating 
also for those that had never had any interest in Jung's work before. And I guess it is fair to state today that the publication of the Red Book has influenced the perception of Jung's life work as no other work since the publication of his memoirs in 1962. Uh, it is clear that the Red Book has reached an audience way beyond the established readership of organized students and disciples of analytical psychology. Simultaneously with the release of the facsimile edition, a first exhibition was organized at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York in 2009, where the original of the book was shown together with a small selection of additional images of the same period painted by Jung. The exhibition then traveled on to the Hammer Museum uh, in Los Angeles, where it was shown in 2010. The Red Book original was also on display in Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress, uh, before it finally returned to Europe, where it was uh, exhibited at an even, even larger exhibition, including additional carvings, sculptures, and images of Jung in Zurich at the Museum Rietberg in late 2010. And then uh, this exhibition still traveled on to Paris, uh, to the Musée Guimet in the following year. Since its early beginnings in public life, Jung's Red Book has become a center of attention wherever it traveled for exhibition purposes. And the sales it created have helped us at the foundation of the works of Siege Jung a lot in furthering the cause of publishing Jung. Until today, the English edition of the Red Book alone has sold well over 200,000 copies. And the sales are split. I think it's it's almost 100,000 cloth-bound copies, another 100,000 uh, of the reader's edition, and then there's around 12,000 of the uh, ebook uh, version of the Red Book that have been sold to date. These figures are from February. I think it's the last time we checked with the publisher. The Red Book in the meantime has been translated into 22 languages, including Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Polish, Arabic, Turkish, Chinese, Japanese, but also for minor language markets such as Dutch, Hebrew, Czech, Lithuanian, Greek, even Azeri. What is more, we have expected for a few years now for the sales number to dwindle, uh, but, but it's it's not happening to, uh, and, and it is happening, but not to a degree we expected. The, the market doesn't seem to be saturated at this point in time. It has possibly been reinforced, this trend, uh, by the subsequent release of the Art of Sichi Jung volume and, and the Black Books, even more recently, which document Jung's additional art and, and raw material to the uh, Red Book, of course. So this is a bit of the publication history of what we're gonna discuss in the next uh, few days. Uh, we've come across uh, a number of explanations uh, for the success of the Red Book. And I would like to lay out the land a bit of, of uh, where we may find explanation for this unexpected uh, and surprising uh, attention it has created. It sure has been a door opener for us, the publication for Jung's work um, uh, beyond the Red Book itself. So it has increased and, and generated a new interest and trend for, for uh, the spreading of his work in general. Uh, it started with a renewed interest by the U.S. publisher, Princeton University Press, uh, who understood that uh, maybe there's still interest and a market uh, to be catered to with new and so far unedited material by Jung. And uh, a new cooperation materialized, uh, and a new dynamic, I would even say, around the collaboration with Princeton, Philemon Foundation, our foundation, bringing in the publication rights with a new set of volumes under the label of the, of the Philemon Foundation 
series. Um, independently of the Philemon series, uh, we have also seen a second generation of young historians venturing into the exploration and editing of newly discovered primary material in the past decade. As a case in point, I would like to mention Riccardo Bernardini, the organizer of our conference here, uh, with a series of new publications from the Eranos archives, authored by Jung. Another example is the Foundation's recent cooperation with a team of editors in Budapest, who are preparing a publication of the correspondence of Jung with the Hungarian scholar of mythology, Karl Kereny, himself a resident of the Ticino, that's why I'm bringing him up, uh, after exiling from his own country, and a mainstay of the Eranos conferences over, long, over a period of, of uh, long years. So while Italy, Brazil, and the rest of Latin America have traditionally been good markets for Jung, we have also seen renewed interest in France, and to a moderate extent in Germany in the past few years. These are two countries in which Jung, for different reasons, had a difficult standing in the past. In France, in particular, it has been thanks to a few dedicated individuals who invested their energy and resources into publishing new Jung titles after the market lay sleeping for some time. And I mean, I'd like to welcome and point out Christine Maillardi, uh, translator for the rap book text who is with us here today. But it is far beyond these traditional language markets that Jung made new inroads in the past de decade, with new works coming out also in more exotic places, such as Iran. Uh, one of the smallest markets I think he was able to uh, establish himself is Albania more recently. All this is to illustrate the tremendous push that pu the publication of the Red Book has given to the research and publishing activities of the foundation of the works of Jung and its cooperation partners since 2009. This uh, gives me the opportunity to may have a sip of water before I continue. <laughs> Thank you. So, not all of the renewed interest can be accounted for by the Red Book alone, of course. Uh, among the translation and re-edition rights most in demand in the past two years, for example, are Jung's Flying Saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the skies from 1956. And of course, the 1932 Kundalini Yoga Seminar, which clearly owe their interest in the market to current trends not necessarily rooted in the Jungian work or the Red Book publication. And it also remains to be seen in how far the upward trend in the past few years will continue in light of rising paper costs, broken supply chains, already staggering inflation rates in many parts of the world in the wake of the pandemic and the new war in Europe. What remains important to us at the Foundation, however, is the fact that the increased sales of new and, and already existing books over the past decade have allowed us to undertake a number of projects for which we wouldn't have had the financial basis otherwise to carry them out, such as measures for the preservation of Jung's library, the digitization, digitization of his alchemical rare book collection, but also for further historical research projects about Jung's dealings with Nazi Germany and, and a first time cooperation with the psychology department at the University of Zurich. Or, and this is more important maybe for this uh, audience here, the further investigation and preservation of Jung's visual artistic legacy. This last aspect was probably the most understudied element of Jung's work before the publication of 
the Red Book, as Murray has also pointed out, active imagination has re-entered the scene with the publication of the Red Book. And, and that is simply because this cornerstone to the understanding of this work was not available before for further inquiry. With the publication of the Red Book as a full facsimile, a wider audience for the first time took note that Jung not only was a highly original thinker and author, but also a gifted maker of paintings and objects in the tradition of outsider art. Although he always insisted that his, his visual works uh, when, when not to be seen as objects of arts, and, and that their first and foremost importance was a genuine expression of human nature and soul. Even someone with only a superficial idea of art could not miss, after the publication of the Red Book, how much Jung also was a master in this discipline. The inclusion of the Red Book uh, as a central object to the Venice Art Biennale in 2013 meant an ultimate accolade and recognition of the fact that Carl Jung's sculptures, objects, drawings and paintings can indeed bear comparison with contemporary works of art. Even can be considered to belong to the avant-garde of his time in this field. In that sense, it seems legit legitimate today to speak about Jung's visual creative work also in the context of modern art, and not only in a psychological and cultural context. Or as Massimiliano Gioni, the curator of the 2013 uh, Vienna Art Biennale uh, and the director of the New Museum in New York observed when asked if he viewed Jung's visual work as art, he said, it is not a question of the definition of art or the intention of the maker, the intention of its maker, but of the quality of the work itself. That same sentiment was also there with Jim Mayers and Norton, who had seen a few standalone objects by Jung's hand in the context of the Rubin Museum exhibition in 2009, and who immediately suggested that we follow up with a wider publication of Jung's visual work, if the foundation was ever interested in such a project, without knowing he preached to the choir. Uh, as the committee of years at the time had already started with an inventory, localizing Jung's complete visual work and collecting information concerning its history and meaning since the 1990s. So when I took over uh, the running of the Foundation's Affairs in 2013, we made this the main focus of our work, uh, our own editorial work. And the very first project that was entirely planned, researched and edited by the Foundation itself. Eventually, this led to the preparation of the Art of C.G. Jung volume, which was finally presented to a wider audience in 2019. And the publication was launched with a full overview exhibition and a large conference in Santa Barbara, California. Organized by the Art and Psyche series, Linda, Joe, I'm looking at you and your colleagues, uh, together with the Pacifica Graduate Institute, again, and the local university, which was a great feat, I think. It became an event to which many of the speakers of our conference here actively contributed as well. So when looking for explanations why the publication of the Red Book has triggered such an enormous amount of and renewal of interest in Jung's work, there are a number of factors we can identify. First and foremost, it was a clever publication, uh, marketing by the publisher. Uh, but there are at least five other factors that I would like to mention specifically. I've spoken about the fascination that the 20th century man had been able to such a monk-like contemplation 
of his inner life, besides all the attention and work that requested his outer life as an analyst and scholar at the time. The visual appeal and the artistic mastery of the result from his soul experiment needs no further commenting at this stage either. But what we certainly observed was that with its evident visual qualities, the Red Book opened up Jung's work to a new audience that wasn't previously drawn or aware of his methods and ideas. I mean, honestly, and most of you probably agree, his style of writing is, can sometimes be a challenge. The focus on the inner images in the Red Book as a key to unlocking the deeper meaning of the individual soul and the myths of our society now allowed a more visually oriented audience to encounter Jung's thoughts and ideas from a different angle. And I think it was in a personal conversation with uh, Stephen Eisenstadt. Stephen, thank you. Uh, three years ago, Santa Barbara Conference, which made me specifically aware that, that at least since the millennials, we are seeing a new generation of students interested in Jung that has grown up indulging itself in visual communication uh, and where imagined worlds occupy a central role in their lives, uh, be it in video games, Netflix series, or the latest trends, Instagram and TikTok, of course. In that context, the pictorial world of the Red Book seems naturally accessible to this current generation, maybe more so than any of Jung's previously published writings. The plot and the success of movie series, such as the production of the Game of Thrones or the Marvel's Avengers universe, generally speak of a renewed fascination for the mythical realm, at least in my view. And speaking from my very personal own experience of reading to my boys, they're born in 2010 and 2013, I, I can tell there's a whole new segment of fantasy literature and series very popular with children and youth these days, which take inspiration from and are modeled after the templates of classic mythology, ancient legends, sagas, old fairy tales, with, with characters are frequently morphing and, and, and protagonists passing through portals through different times, from the real world to an imaginary and back, just like Jung's cast of characters does in the Black Books and the Red Book, when he puts them on the stage of his inner dialogues in which he was trying to permit the boundaries of the conscious to the unconscious world. Second, in parallel to the search of the visual and imaginary in everyday life and the arts, there is also a return of interest in the spiritual and the occult, not only in private, but also in the field of academic studies to be observed in more recent years. So we have a new discipline in the history of psychology, but there's also a new subfield uh, uh, emerging or which has ac actually established itself in the studies of the history of Western esotericism, where Jung's interest in Gnosticism, Hermetics, Alchemy, and so forth fit in all too well. Uh, a lot of the current research interest around Jung, the Red Book, and related material we, we are encountering in our work at the Foundation actually comes from this side. And this means it is also bringing a new generation of university students in the humanities back into contact with the work of Jung again. Third, from the clinical side, while Jungian concepts 30 years ago may have suffered from heavy criticism, more recent neurological research into the plasticity of the brain and, and, and the epigenetics uh, have lent new plausibility to some of Jung's fundamental ideas, the activity of psychological archetypes or the existence of a collective unconscious. I'm not sure how far the discussion actually has gone by now, but at the very least, these latest research trends have offered new possibilities of a discussion 
reconsidering Jungian ideas also in a clinical and, and uh, uh, neurological research context again as well. Fourth, likewise contributing to the renewed interest in Jung in the past few years is the popularization of his thoughts and work through public intellectuals as well as through pop culture. It's been touched before uh, in the Q&A uh, session. I think it was around 2015, 16, that an American PhD student sitting here with us today, Kali Lachlan, made me aware of the name of Jordan Peterson, a Toronto-based clinical psychology professor, YouTube personality, and public intellectual who had started to gather quite some traction in the media, openly stating that about 50% of his ideas were directly borrowed from Carl Gustav Jung. Sure enough, only a year or so later, Peter uh, sailed across the Atlantic, came to Europe on a lecture tour, and never looking back, also became a best-selling author in the old world. With his podcasts, TED Talks, YouTube conversations, gathering millions of views, he probably reached an audience that none of Jung's own books or works would ever be able to tap into. A similar figure, uh, also equally popular uh, in, in the public debate, has emerged in the French public discussion more recently with Frédéric Lenoir, although I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much, how much he actually influences already a, a perception of Jung. But still, he, he, he is someone who shows up on TV, uh, a recognizable face, and he had dedicated his latest book entirely to the work and ideas of Jung. And again, it, with that is probably doing more that, than we are able to do from our side to bring Jung into uh, the public perception uh, in that language. As much, and it has been said before as well, by Murray specifically, as much as personalities like Peterson or Lenoir do to promote and further uh, the revival of Carl Jung's work, I, I do not conceal a certain concern also about the prominence of these figures given that they also have their own vanities and agendas for which they use the name of Jung to lend more credibility to their argumentation. If any example is needed of where this can lead to, it is to be found in Donald Trump's infamous book, The Art of the Deal, where he goes on record saying that he had read Carl Jung's work and had learned a great deal from it, how to be an executive leader. And I bite my tongue not to further comment on this. A less problematic form of popularization of Jungian ideas has most recently come in the form of Korean pop music. Ever since Carl Jung's portrait made it on the album cover of the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Bands, artists and musicians have now and then made allusion to or taken inspiration from Jung in their work but probably none as prominently as the K-pop pop band BTS, who dedicated a full two-volume album released in February 2020, borrowing its title, Map of the Soul, from Mary Stein's, yes, please hold it up, it's here, uh, from Mary Stein's best-selling introduction to the work of Jung. Again, it is the enormous popularity and, and, and outrage of BTS which makes this a significant multiplier when it comes to the scale of attention the album uh, brought to Jung and Jungian ideas for a new segment of listeners. Murray, together with Steve Boozer and, and, and Len Cruz has written a whole book about it and they're much more qualified to explain this phenomenon than I am. Which leads me to fifth a, as a final factor that I want to mention for the return of the interest in Jung in recent years. Uh, this has to do, obviously has to do, with the outer circumstances of our time. As dire as our times may appear at the very present, our literary agent already for a few years now has observed a general return of the market 
to the classics in literature and philosophy. A segment to which Jung, just like Goethe, Nietzsche, Kant, Hegel, you name them, belongs to. Very generally speaking, with the acceleration of globalization and its growing negative effects in all or in many ways uh, felt on an individual level, a growing individual need and desire to ask for the underlying conditions and meaning of human life has manifested itself in many parts of the world. When the times are perceived as unpredictable and insecure, people seem to long for orientation and a deeper meaning of their individual lives. And again, here, Jung and the Red Book provide one example of a human being that has attempted to get to the bottom of these questions and whose experience offers an example of how to address the spiritual and psychological needs of our time. To conclude, we from the foundation of the works of C.J. Jung independently of the ups and downs of current world events or cultural trends, remain committed to bringing Jung to publication, keeping the discussion around his work and life awake. For we believe that here is a man that throughout his life has attempted in an honest and unflinching way to explore the psychological conditions of human existence on his own example with the Red Book being the ultimate testimony to this undertaking. So this is what I have to offer to you as a few initial thoughts to this conference, and I'm very much uh, looking forward to the further proceedings of our gathering here. Many thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.